Hey, good morning, y'all. I guess we're live. And uh, it's good to be with you. I'm Paul Swenson with After Incorporated. And uh, we're uh, happy to be a sponsor uh, of this conference. And I uh, appreciate the technology and Roz and team uh, who have brought us together uh, to be able to, to, to be here together and share some uh, good ideas and some thoughts, some great things have been uh, shared uh, already. So appreciate that. Um, I know most of you, and uh, so it's great to, to be with you, even if it has to be a little bit strange uh, during these times. It's good to, to be with you all, see your faces, and uh, get some great ideas from you. Um, you know, and, and also many in, in the, uh, that are taking part in the conference are also client partners of AFTER, and so I want you to know that we very much appreciate our ongoing partnerships and so on. Uh, I'm a man of few words, as, as many of you know. Uh, so let's get right into it. We've got 20 minutes to kind of go through some things. Oh, my chat box lighting up with people who don't agree. I'm a man of few words. I'm, I'm going to cut them off. Just now. Got to have a little fun. Hey, so what's really changed during the pandemic? Uh, what additional opportunities exist? Will they last? Uh, or have they always existed? They're just a little different. Uh, how can I know more about my end user customers? And uh, how do I stay relevant and increase? Uh, lifetime value and loyalty with them. So during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of changes. No surprise there. We've got new office protocols. Many of our offices are still closed. Uh, travel restrictions. Uh, we've got new local protocols uh, that we're all dealing with. Virtual meetings like this one. One of my favorite things that, that I hear often is uh, when someone doesn't turn their video on, uh, they'll, they'll sometimes say, I'm just not video ready today. Uh, I really like that one. Um, we have found, and many companies have found, that hey, remote offices uh, and working from remote offices can work really well. Uh, and in fact, it can be uh, very economical and also very efficient. And so I think we'll see some ongoing changes uh, there as well. Uh, it's oftentimes, as has been mentioned already this morning, it's oftentimes easier to get a hold of key people, um, you know, especially when we're working from home or limited in the office. It can work in reverse, but most often it's easier to get a hold of key people. And then we have change on top of change. So just as soon as we think we've got things kind of figured out, then we have more changes again, and that's going to continue for a while. But it's also created new levels of creativity. Uh, and then I know we're all kind of trying to figure out what does the new normal look like uh, after uh, we're done with the, the pandemic or at least get it under control. One thing that, that we've all seen is that U.S. people and businesses are very resilient. And uh, in spite of some of the things we've seen, the core of this country and the businesses here, uh, I, I think, have demonstrated a, a great resiliency and are bouncing back really well. So here are some of the uh, changes that we've seen. I know you've all seen this, but while we're facing difficult times, we've also seen th some things happen with uh, while, while people and families are socially distancing, many are also spending more time together, and that's resulted in some interesting sales trends. Uh, for example, large increases in sales in many sectors. Marine, try and buy a boat right now. Uh, we tried. Uh, right now, many of the boat manufacturers are just filling sold orders, and they're two to three months out. Uh, power sports, uh, ATVs, side-by-sides, and so on. Uh, sales have gone through the roof. Uh, RVs, trailers, uh, recreational vehicles, pickup trucks, tow vehicles, uh, sporting goods, outdoor furniture, barbecue, games, outdoor power equipment, gaming. All of those have seen huge increases in sales and uh, has created some product uh, and inventory shortages in many sectors. At the same time, and I think this has been, you know, talked uh, this morning really well, and that is the service contract attach rates have increased, both at point of sale and miss point of sale. Consumers are buying and they're protecting uh, their product. It, we saw the same thing, by the way, in the so-called Great Recession. Uh, attach rates went up. Uh, so how do we learn from this and, and how do we get smarter and better about what we're doing? Uh, so what new opportunities are created and have they really changed? Uh, I would suggest that these opportunities have always existed, uh, but they're more important than ever. And we're also seeing a difference in the way consumers purchase. 
Uh, and so we need to stay on top of those emerging trends. And I'm also going to suggest that most manufacturers and retailers are not doing a very good job of keeping their customers engaged between major purchases, in spite of what they might think on the surface. And we'll go more into this. And when they don't do a great job of keeping their customers engaged between the purchase the purchases, they, they lose revenue, they lower repurchase rates, uh, and they let customers go to competitors. So some of the questions that you know we kind of ask of each other as we help um, you know these situations and, and customers through their lifetime value uh, stream, if you will, is what percentage of the customers bought extended service plans? Uh, how many consumers buy OEM parts or do they buy aftermarket parts? Uh, where does each customer purchase their aftermarket supplies? Again, are they thir purchasing third-party accessories and consumables? Or are they going back to the OEM? Uh, how many customers are at risk of buying a competitive product? Uh, how many and when are they in the market to repurchase? Are there various, uh, you know, life cycle programs working together to work a common goal? And I'm going to speak to that in just a, a minute or two. Uh, interesting things that we see happening there all the time. And are the lifetime value programs co cohesive, uh, timely, and relevant? So how much opportunity is really being left behind? So I'm going to look at it in the simplest terms. I know we all know this, but I think reminders are important that the easiest place to get new business is where we already have business. I know we all know that, but sometimes I think we forget that. I know I do. Are we all and, and our partners, both in, in manufacturing and retail, spend a lot of time at the bottom uh, of this chart in, in acquiring new customers? We spend some time kind of identifying those customers and, and taking a look at the metadata behind them when we can identify them. And then we have various programs to go out with extended service, related products, accessories, consumables, and so on, all with the hope of repurchasing uh, a new major product. Uh, but how can we get smarter and, and better at this? I'm going to distill it down into four keys for success. Uh, if it could. One is uh, making sure that we've got the right technology, uh, robust, secure databases, uh, e-commerce platforms with a lot of dynamic content that works the way the consumers want it to work, uh, compliant with the regulatory um, requirements, uh, real-time apps uh, for inventory and upsell so that we can uh, make sure that we fulfill the, the, the customer's needs when they want us. Uh, the right kind of analytics, uh, a lot of time is spent on this, but there are differences between analytics that really have their roots uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s with the type of analytics that we can really do today uh, and then integrate them uh, into smart marketing programs and bulletproof operations. Uh, again, we all know this, but when the customer needs us, we need to make sure that we're fulfilling the promise and going above, <clears throat> excuse me, above and beyond uh, with a really rigorous quality control and constant attention to lowering costs while delighting uh, the customer. I want to take a little look at, at kind of a simple continuum, if you will, of maximizing the customer value and kind of taking a look at that journey. If, if we take a look at the connected programs, they can provide incremental revenue uh, uh, they can increase satisfaction and loyalty and lead to more sales. And this is kind of a simple look at, you know, we start with, we've got to know the customer. So we start with registration or identifying the customer. Uh, it's a retail, it's making sure we've got a system that captures their information at the point of sale. Uh, if we don't, if it's not, if our point of sale is, is through dealers and so on, then we've got a different uh, uh, issue to solve if we're a manufacturer, and that is we've got to find a way to really identify those customers. Um, so we oftentimes start with extended service contracts. Uh, we'll have a thank you, a subscription program, maybe a loyalty program, a maintenance program, and so on. Uh, but they're often disjointed. And, and so I want to take a look at some phase examples. And this, this is just an example. Uh, there's a, there's kind of a, 
a uh, saying that I like, and that is, don't try to boil the ocean. Start somewhere. And so if we look at this continuum and we say, you know, I want to identify customers, I want to look at accessories, consumables, subscription programs, loyalty programs, maintenance, uh, and all those along the way, the very foundation of this is to make sure that we've got the right registration experience and technology and to incorporate uh, analytics right at that point. Um, if we don't have a service contract program, we need to build one, to start one. If we have one today, how can we change it up? How can we make it different? How, an example is, you know, you, you think back, many of us have been around for a while, think back on laptops and, and, and uh, tablets and so on. First it was break fix, then we act, added accidental damage. Now there's data and image and memory recovery uh, that can protect the, the most valuable uh, asset uh, on those products, which is the data, the images, the memories, and so on. So expand those service contract programs to include missed point of sale. Expand them to dealers, uh, do renewals, uh, incorporate accessories and consumables into those marketing uh, phases that, and do it in a very uh, consistent way. Um, and it, as we do that, we can also take a look at the service contract program and realize that oftentimes that service contract program can fund the lifetime value strategy as it evolves. Um, here's one of the issues we see too, by the way, um, I'll talk about this in a second here. A lot of times we hear um, partners or potential partners say, hey, we've got several of these programs. We're in pretty good shape. But when you peel the layers back, they're not. And, and we see oftentimes that while these, some of these programs may exist, they oftentimes lack the necessary ingredients of a really, truly individual customer targeted approach. And part of that is because they rely on, on 20, 20th century style registration and lead capture programs. They, they use rudimentary analytics. There's a lack of a cohesive strategy uh, that's constantly tested and improved. And there's no real feedback mechanism. Uh, typically what happens is, oh, we sent uh, out this direct mail, we sent out these emails, our attach rate was X. Uh, it was better than last month, so that's great. No, it's really not because we're looking at it at an aggregate level instead of an individual customer uh, and segment, uh, deeply segmentation, uh, segmented levels. And uh, the various customer initiatives are often siloed in a large bureaucracy. And I want to speak to that real, real quickly. A lot of times we'll see service contracts might be under finance. Accessories and consumables might be in parts, managed by parts. Loyalty and maintenance programs might be managed by marketing. And those silos oftentimes don't talk to one another. They're running individual programs rather than a cohesive approach uh, to the customer lifetime value. Uh, and that's where we see a lot of opportunity. Uh, if you take a look at, at the very foundation of this, it's the right technology where we can learn more about the customer, identify who they are, and immediately apply analytics to it. So the second that customer is identified, every single one of them needs to come into that registration or identification process and immediately be evaluated against the existing customer base so that we can instantaneously household them and score them and start to put them on a very relevant strategy for that particular customer. If a customer can't be identified in the, in the database, then let's immediately append uh, external uh, variables uh, to that customer record so that we can begin the scoring process using the latest models that we've got built. So the moment they come into the system, we start to work analytics on them uh, so that we can then place each customer product lead into a prescribed journey. Uh, and then uh, we need to use our models to reevaluate and rescore each customer along the journey. And I'll give you an example. Let's say I purchased a lawn tractor. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, I got a direct mail solicitation uh, suggesting that I should come in uh, and purchase a, uh, a, a dump wagon that goes along with that uh, lawn tractor. And let's say I choose to purchase that over the web, and I purchase it over the web and I have it shipped to me. That happens all the time now. That should 
to change me and that customer continuum so that the next solicitation that I get, because I, I purchased through the web. So the, the next solicitation I get in that continuum for more accessories or consumables or whatever should be email with a hot link. Uh, with a with a personal URL, as opposed to the more expensive direct marketing, and and that should and then if I don't respond to that, then we can come back to direct mail. But we need to do that on the fly. We can't fall into the trap of treating every customer lead the same way, uh, because we miss a lot of opportunity that way. This is just one example of part of the journey. Let's say it's service contracts. It needs to be multi-channel. We can do things like put a PQR code that shows up through the envelope window so the customer doesn't even need to open the envelope thing, put their phone up against it, and boom, it pops them right into the mobile application so that they can make a purchase. A personal URL um, in the uh, direct marketing letter or a hot link uh, personal URL uh, in the email. So it takes them directly to uh, their own personal landing page, showing them the product that they purchased, not just a general product, but the exact one that they purchased. Customers will know that we know them. Uh, and when they do, they're more apt to buy. And, and this is just one example of the, the customer journey. So our suggestion, and, and I know we all know this, but we fall into the trap of having disconnected communications with the customer or using a shotgun as opposed to a, a real targeted approach uh, to each customer. So if we can systematically connect these programs together, they strengthen one another. Uh, service contract programs, accessories, consumables, maintenance, repurchase programs, there's a powerful synergistic impact from each of those together uh, and they build off of one another. Uh, we, we all know that a purchase, the customers who, who purchase service contracts are more likely to purchase accessories and consumables and vice versa. So let's build on these um, in, in a way that really helps our, the customer experience, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, is making sure that the customer has a great experience, that they enjoy the product that they've purchased, they find more enjoyment by having uh, more accessories, uh, by keeping it maintained properly so it runs and operates well, uh, and then they're more likely to come back and upgrade. Um, we hope your families stay well and uh, keep calm and carry on and let's make things happen.